Welcome to Strip Cover Alert, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for another Writer's Quote video. This is the 46th video in the Writer's Quote series. I am not sure if I'm just going to keep going with this series or if I'm going to try and do other things. I think 52 videos would be a, a good number because it would be a video a week for a year, right? Something like that. But anyway, we have here a quote from Miyamoto Musashi. Very interesting man, very interesting life, very interesting lessons to be learned from him if you are not familiar with him. Uh, there are thousands of videos on YouTube about Miyamoto Musashi and his uh, philosophies. I suggest looking him up. <clears throat> but this is a simple quote. This is a simple, simple quote. Is it not? Do nothing that is of no use. Do nothing that is of no use. What does that mean? Don't screw around. But I think that for a writer, this can apply to both writing as well as the writer's life. Um, what do I mean by that? In writing, <clears throat> I think it's fairly obvious, but it's something that is, it is something that is contentious inside the writing process. It is something that you will find yourself struggling with yourself to do. Why? Because sometimes things present themselves to us in ways that are easy to get on the page, but aren't ultimately uh, unfruitful for a reader. And that's what you know, you, you want a reader. In writing, every word must serve a purpose. So, maybe, maybe you say you have a superfluous narrator. I have a narrator that likes to talk a lot. It's a first-person narrator. He likes to say things that maybe don't necessarily pertain to the story, that don't necessarily push us forward, that don't necessarily add up to much uh, experiential for the reader, then that too must serve a purpose. What does the wordiness tell us about our narrator? Is this wordiness a narrator trying to make up for the fact that he or she does not know what he or she is talking about is the wordiness involved one of these unreliable narrators that is saying so much because he's trying to mislead you ultimately he's trying to mislead you in the end he's trying to well you know all this going on over here while i'm really doing this over here is that why your narrator is so talkative is so verbose explicates so dramatically? Is that why? If not, if not, then you need to rethink whether or not your narrator is, in fact, the wordy type. Because there are, you can put any number of words you want to into a story. And it doesn't necessarily make it any better, right? Obviously, with writing advice like this, we are always drawn to someone like Hemingway, Hemingway, who was so very sparse with his words, but in fact was able to put novels worth of thought into a short story and oftentimes, technically, a flash fiction. So the next question that comes up, if you're talking about leaving things out of the writing, what about details? If you tell us a character has a five o'clock shadow, for example, why did you tell us that? Why does that character need, and I know this is going to seem pedantic, but I promise you, this improves writing. This improves writing. Why would a character have a five o'clock shadow? If they, if they, if you don't have a reason for the character to have a five o'clock shadow, Maybe he has one, but you don't need to tell us. The argument may come, well, it's for verisimilitude. 
or to tell my reader what the character looks like. But there is no reason. So this is this is something that I, I will fight for tooth and nail. Have you ever just two two easy examples, Fight Club and Jurassic Park. If you have seen either of those movies, the characters in the books are indelibly the actors who played them. And it's true, I'm sure, for a lot of books, but those in particular. If you've read any of the Silence of the Lambs series, you know, you know what Hannibal Lecter looks like. You know it. None of the books describe those characters in those fashions. Roughly, loosely, sort of almost. But if I were casting any of those movies based on the books, I would not have picked any of those actors for the way that they are explained on the page. Really, there is no reason to make a character look like anything because your reader is going to cast that character in their mind's eye regardless of what you tell them unless there is a reason for that physical feature on that character and that will come through if your character has a five o'clock shadow is it because he cannot find the desire to take care of himself he shaves once in a while but doesn't have the wherewithal to, to wear a full beard. He can't find the desire to take care of himself because his fiance left him. His fiance left him because he's a drunkard, right? So if you just give your character the idea that, oh yeah, um, John Smith here, he's got a five o'clock shadow. It doesn't matter because three pages later, your reader is going to forget that and will be imagining that character any way that they please. So I think a lot of the details that we give on um, appearances are superfluous to some extent. Well, what about setting, right? You, we've read The Lord of the Rings. We understand that every tree branch has X number of leaves on it. We understand that the breeze blows and there's only certain types of grass that wilt depending on the speed of the the breeze the wind speed but here's the thing if no one's going to sit on the sofa in the corner you don't need to tell us about it and it becomes a little bit it does become a little bit reductionalist it does become a little bit um it becomes a little bit predictable because you're giving us the sort of ideas we need in our mind for the scene to unfold, right? If no one's going to sit on the sofa in the corner, we don't need to read about it. So when we do read about it, we know something's going to happen there. Well, that makes it become predictable. A little bit of predictability, that type of predictability is fine. That's fine. You're it's not predictable as much as it is familiar for a reader at that point. They know where they are. So what about the writer's life then? How do we incorporate do nothing that is of no use into the writer's life? I have, I have, there were two times when I was in graduate school where I became irreconcilably angry. And they're the opposite sides of this quote. One time, I had a, I had a class, and the entire quarter, this, this school was broken up into quarters, the entire quarter, all I was responsible for writing in a master's level class was a single short story. How disappointing is that? So, uh, I did what I do. I did the same amount of work that I would do if I were supposed to write 50,000 words in that quarter. I wrote all of that stuff anyway. It was of no use to my master's program. It still was of use to me. 
I was still doing what I needed to do as a writer. The second time, I mean, what a worthless class, right? You're at a master's level and you're turning in a single short story. The second time that I was irreconcilably angry, every period for this class, we were forced to do warm-up exercises. Warm-up exercises, really? What, what for? Things like describe this item. The professor would have some little thing we'd have to write for five minutes on it. It's stupid. Write about a time where you felt dot, dot, dot. Write about a time where you did dot, dot, dot. But here's the thing. As we talked about earlier in this video, describing something without context is worthless. The entirety of the diction that you use to describe, and I say it's a vase. It's a vase, right? Describe this vase in 300 words. Whose point of view What's the story? What's the time in the story? I mean, you can take a description of something, the same thing, and change it at the beginning versus the end of a story. Why? Because the character changed, and it changes the way he or she sees that thing. So just the, the act of describing something is, why? Don't waste my time. Now, and if you're writing about, well, write about a time where you felt X, Y, Z, write about a time where you did A, B, C. If you're not turning that into a story, and here's the thing, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong because I have used journaling to try to uh, get into things before. But here's the thing. If I, on those days where I used journaling to get my cranium going, if I could have sat down and instead of writing 300 words of journaling and 500 words of a story, written instead 800 words of the story, I would have done it. I'd choose it every time. Every time I would choose that. So that, I think, is what we can garner from these words of Miyamoto Musashi. Now, Miyamoto Musashi was a duelist. He dueled with swords and weapons. All advice from every domain in life can be transferred over into whatever it is that you are trying to do. Everything. Life is life. This is the way. This is the way of things. So anytime that you see something like Miyamoto Masashi, or one of my favorites is Robert Greene, 48 Laws of Power, Mastery, um, 33 Strategies of War, all of these things, translating these things into writing um, is invaluable, in my opinion, because it gets you thinking critically, not just about the craft, but about the strategy of the craft, about the, and about the way that we live in order to write. That is all I have for this video, the 46th video in the Writer's Quote series. If you enjoy what I do here, hitting that like button really helps me out on the channel. It tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers, other writers as well. And if you find yourself here by chance but not design, consider hitting the subscribe button in order to stick around for more. And I hope to see you for the next one.